Harold, let me start off by thanking you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today. Um, for our viewing audience, can you please uh, t give us your name and your background and tell us about your association with this uh, professional society? Uh, my name is Harold Stolovich and I am an Emeritus Professor of Human Learning and Performance. Uh, we can just simply say workplace learning and performance to make it simple. And uh, I've been at this, in a sense, all my life. Uh, I started working when I was extremely young and uh, have always pulled together two pieces. For me, learning and work were always related. And uh, all during my educational period, I worked. And while I worked, I was always anxious and excited about all the things I learned. So it was only natural that I should turn the two together. Um, I've had a background in teaching, first of all, as I taught little children uh, in my early days when I just graduated from uh, university and then went on to uh, work overseas. I spent five years in Africa uh, working to help develop a, a learning and performance type system there. And then when I came back, to the U.S. I continued doing graduate work and eventually uh, became a faculty member at the world's largest French university, Université de Montréal in Montreal, and headed the instructional and performance technology uh, specialties and programs there, the graduate programs. Uh, I spent, did a stint as the Associate Dean of Research with my respect to my, respect to my relationship with uh, HPT, um, while I was a student at Indiana University, uh, one of our professors, Civ Asylum Tiagarajan, also known as Tiagi, um, invited students to come along with him to Washington, D.C. in 1975 to a conference of NSPI, the National Society for Had and I'm leaving a blank because it used to be programmed instruction and had recently become performance and instruction. And uh, there, six students piled into his little car. We all slept on mattresses on the floor in his room and got involved and uh, were bitten. One of the most exciting things was that the luminaries in our field, the people who, who had written articles that we were studying or books that we were using in our studies, were at the conference and people like Susan Markle and Bill Detterline and Joe Harless and Thomas Gilbert, all of these people, uh, Robert Mager, uh, were just so exciting to meet, very welcoming and the, the upshot of it was that the very next year uh, I had said, gee, we really ought to have a session for newcomers and so they said, fine, go and organize one and the very next year I was running a session for newcomers. So that's how ISPI worked for me and, and becoming, coming in contact with these people who had spent a long time on what we call the science of learning, and this is really important, the science of learning, um, had an enormous impact on me. The, the key thing is that through this exposure, um, I began to understand that although I was an educator in my heart, and I still am today, that we can learn as much as we want, but if we really want to make a difference, we have to leverage what we know how to do in ways that people value, their organizations value, their customers value, and regulatory agencies and the community and so on. So if I were to define then who I am as part of the human performance technology field, uh, and if somebody says, you know, sort of explain to me, I don't understand, I simply say, look, in any organization, all you have are either products or services, processes and people. And what I do is to help you have the very best products and services that your customers love and that they value and that the people who produce them value and you value 
is by looking at what stops them from doing it and what can help them to do it better. And the great thing is that for very little investment, you get a fantastic return. So that would be a very simple way, you know, uh, when people say, so could you sum it up? And I say, yeah, I help engineer the systems that let your people produce that which everyone values. So that would be kind of like my way of, you know, getting into it. Who, um, so your first exposure is 75 with Tiagi. Who, uh, in addition, I guess, to Tiagi, who were your major influences if you were to name a, a small handful of them? Well, from a thinking perspective, the most important influences on me were Tom Gilbert and Gary Rumler. Um, sadly, both have passed away now, but I had the good fortune to spend time with them. And uh, they really gave me a sense of what it is to separate the mythologies that we have from the actual outcomes that we really desire. Um, to put it simply, we, we believe that if we teach people to do something, that they ought to be able to do it. And we neglect the fact that there are so many environmental influences that either inhibit them or potentially could facilitate it. And that's something that took me a while to really understand until I began to do analyses of the things that I'm doing. So those two were very important. Joe Harless, um, in his almost, I want to say, southern preacher type style, hammered into me <laughs> and others um, models that were both easy to understand applic and applicable. And uh, through the examples that he provided, I soon began to see that not only can I make a difference, but there are ways we can do it. Um, Susan Markle, who also recently passed away, alas, uh, was another one of those people who really helped me to understand that you don't need huge amounts of data and casts of thousands in order to be under to, in order to understand how people learn and how they transform that into on-job application. And um, through her simple studies, what she called her N of one studies, I began to replicate some of those and, and extend them. And spent 10 years actually with, with a research group. We created a research group at our university to extend the type of work that she and others in the area of formative evaluation had done. Um, Tiagi is a mad genius and the creative elements that he has and that he contributes. Um, I think sometimes people don't realize that um, Tiagi's particular role in our technology is to, so, <laughs> trying to articulate this well, is to think not only out of the box but out of the planet. Uh, and come at things from weird angles and what seems logical he turns upside down. Uh, he is he's an inspiration in terms of that creativity. I never want from Tiagi, for example, to know systematically how to do things step by step. I don't want to get from him um, how to do project planning. But if I want a weird thought that will make a difference and so he's a great inspiration to me and always has been. Uh, I mean I could go on endlessly and name things you know if I want to look at engineering I could go to Guy Wallace and how we engineer systems. If I want to know how we can organize and manage I can go to Erica Keeps who not only is an inspiration to me but also my wife uh, and I learned so much from her. So all these are I, I'm almost afraid not to mention others, but mm -hmm. these are probably the ones that come to mind mostly. Let me shift back to <clears throat> your role in ISBI. You've held a number of positions in the society, elected positions. You've done a lot of volunteering on various committees. 
you've won the most prestigious awards that the society has to offer. Please uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your positions in the society and uh, the awards that the society has recognized you with. Oh my God. I have a... Well, you're a president. Box right? is full of recognition type <laughs> yes. things, but it's funny how we get recognized at ISBI. Basically, you start off as president and then work backwards. <laughs> you know, I, that's kind of funny the way I say it. But I did mention that, you know, when I was a student um, in 1975, I finished my PhD then and then went on for another year, sort of like postdoctoral type work um, at Indiana University. And during that year, um, the leaders of ISPI uh, encouraged me to create this newcomer thing. They also encouraged me to, you know, present stuff that I was doing and gave me the courage to actually go about doing it. And so soon afterwards, you know, we won a, a, a research award, mm -hmm. 79. Mm -hmm. um, I was on committees. I think I became a vice president in 19... 79 the equivalent of the of uh, yeah. director on the board now. Yeah, says, and, yeah, and then I found out that the reason I was a vice president uh, was that the vice president organized the conferences and they figured this kid was, you know, kind of like a hardworking kid, you know, mm -hmm. so you got to organize a conference. You know, this is the way things kind of worked. And, uh, and then with name recognition, I guess, eventually I became, you know, president of the society and and through the research that I've done over the years, you know, won some other things. So, yeah, I've had a lot of opportunity to gain recognition through ISPI and, and other organizations. But the key thing is that um, mostly it was do the work, we'll give you the rewards. I mean, hey, it's a consistent with our behaviorist background, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, uh, and then after you've done all the things and won all the awards, don't you dare stop, you know, doing work. I think that's the way I would describe it. Mm -hmm. Well, you've kind of covered your 30-second uh, elevator speech on HPT and what you do earlier. Um, what would you recommend or suggest to others as they explain what they do? What are some of the things that you would counsel them not to do when they're explaining this thing that we call human performance technology? Well, you know, um, there, uh, uh, I wrote a chapter on the evolution of our field and, you know, tried to explain, you know, how, how we got to where we were. Mm -hmm. And that I won't deal with now except for one little piece of it, which is that um, our roots really are learning science, you know, so we need to avow that. Mm -hmm. And we can't get away from it. So we, in our hearts, we still have an affinity toward learning solutions. And that's okay, you know, we acknowledge that we do help people to improve their skills and knowledge. But I would caution anybody in our field when someone comes to us and wants us to do work or if we are going out, you know, we work within an organization and we have our internal clients and we see things that are happening, to never ever name a solution. Mm -hmm. Don't say anything. And if someone comes to you and says, oh my goodness, you know, we built this wonderful product, market research has gone out and they see that there's a need for it, we really can be competitive out there, we've launched it and now, you know, uh, it's not working, we're not selling, you need to go out and train our salespeople to s sell it. Mm -hmm. Never ever say, uh, okay, let's talk about this training or something. You never use the solution. If they say we need an incentive system, never say that. We, I have four simple things. The first is say, so, um, Tell me more. You know, I can help you solve your problem. That I learned from Joe Harless, mm -hmm. right? Yes. To set them at ease, but not talking about their solution, only the problem. And I can help you. I'm not going to solve it. Then listen to them and say, hey, tell me more. 
summarize and say, oh, okay, so this is what's happening. So what would you love to happen? And let them tell you what they would really love. And so in specific detail, based on that, where are we now? And then what would put a smile on your face? What would be success criteria? And what would show you that we met those through the metrics? You know, what kind of measurements can we use? And we walk away saying, hey, I'm going to help you get that. Never, never saying what the solution will be. And then you do your homework. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you build an argument for a systemic group of things. That's what the advice I would give. Mm -hmm. Let me shift gears a little bit here. Thank you for that. Let me shift gears here a bit and talk about and ask you where is Harold Stolovich focused in his learning? What are you what are you trying to learn and master today? Everything. Mm -hmm. Now to be more specific. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the reason for everything is, you know, in 1975, a wonderful French writer by the name of Joël de Rosnay uh, Joel de Rosnay, <laughs> you have to make mm -hmm. it in English, um, wrote a book called Le Macroscope, or the, the Macroscope. I would ask any person coming into our field to please read that book. Because right at the beginning, it's all about system thinking. Mm -hmm. And right from the beginning, he says that the scientist works with a microscope delving ever more deeply into narrower and narrowly, more narrowly defined areas so that they can control what's going on in order to understand the fundamentals. We, in our field, use the macroscope. In other words, it's like a big, big lens that tries to look at everything mm -hmm. and see all the components. So when I said, I'm interested in everything, it's because the smallest things can throw us off. To make it simple, if you have, a, uh, let's say that you're uh, creating an event and you have a wonderful meal that's beautifully prepared and you have wonderful decor and you've invited the right guest mix and everything looks great but the air conditioning breaks down and it's a hot day, it can destroy it. Um, and so one simple thing can throw everything off. And that system's view mm -hmm. of how all the elements work together to produce an outcome. And the reverse of it, you have a system, it needs something. You bring the innovation into it and nothing changes. In other words, the system simply absorbs it and kind of like compresses it and eradicates it. I personally, what I'm looking at, um, and, and my, my, my views have changed over time as well. Um, when I originally was doing a lot of research, it was in the area of instructional systems design, because that's what I was interested in mm -hmm. when I was a student. Um, but then, as I got more and more into looking at how people perform, I focused my attention on exemplary performers. And there, my inspiration was, of course, Tom Gilbert. And looking at what makes the difference between people who, in the same system, are able to do extraordinary things. And what I found is that they're often ordinary people, but have found ways to use all the elements within the system to get in incredibly wonderful outcomes. So I've had the opportunity to work in a number of different environments, whether it's coffee shops like the Starbucks type of coffee shop environment, or in automotive dealerships, or within the military, or within healthcare or finance. Um, what is it that gives the exemplary performance, that the performer that edge, what can we learn that we can feed back into the system? And that means that very often the variables come from all over the place and putting them together is kind of interesting. So that's a major area for me. Mm -hmm. The other area is exploring what the neurosciences are telling us about people. And 
My guess is over the next 10, maybe 20 years, um, the neurosciences are going to guide us with hardcore data on what changes within the human brain take place that will allow us to do things not from speculative points of view, but from hardcore data points mm -hmm. of view. So those are areas of great interest to me. And then the other is extending our field of human performance technology to areas that have yet been unexplored. You know, uh, uh, the educational world where we obviously need to make changes, radical changes in our educational system, to helping immigrants better integrate into society rather than remaining as isolated groups mm -hmm. and having them be able to operate well within a new society into which they come, um, helping those. And when I did my postdoctoral work, I was looking at those who were intellectually challenged to be able to help people who have various types of disabilities to be able to perform more independently. And I think that we have the technology that can help them. Uh, again, if, if you'll let me just ramble on a little bit more, um, a couple of my PhD students, you know, helped me to extend my horizons. Uh, I worked with one of my PhD students on um, a project in which we were looking at the application of H HPT models to um, decreasing medical uh, emergencies. Um, hospital rehospitalization uh, and improve quality of life for the chronically ill aged and there we actually had three hospitals we had a chronically ill uh, a chronically uh, the chronically ill aged populations uh, we were looking at people between 63 and 85 we um, diagnosed them, we did our analyses of their situations, almost like you know, front-end analyses. Mm -hmm. We started off with 120 subjects um, and we divided them into three groups, those that were prescribed their, um, their regimes, both medication and therapies, uh, excuse me, those uh, who were given educational types of uh, interventions, how to use your medicines and so on and those who were given, in quotes, an HPT type of intervention where we looked at a number of variables, including do they have a taxi to get to a doctor or to the hospital for their therapies? Can they actually open their pill bottles mm -hmm. if they have arthritic fingers? Do they have someone who can read the labels to make sure that they can, you know, see what's in the medications and how frequently they should take them and so on? And that allowed us to make some very interesting discoveries. And um, the unfortunate part of that study, <laughs> it was kind of a really sad piece, was that although we saw differences, we did not actually statistically get a significant difference between the educational population and the other population. Mm -hmm. But that was due to a whole new meaning in science when we lose subjects we talk about subject mortality. This was a whole new meaning to us <laughs> in subject mortality. Uh, and unfortunately, because it was a long study, uh, we lost a lot of our subjects. Mm -hmm. And then some who, for whatever reasons, just became fearful to continue. Um, that's part of you know, the, the aging process. But what we did see were some great trends, and I wish that we could continue those types of studies. Mm -hmm. We also were able to work with hospices to improve the relationships and the support between um, staff and patients. We worked with a bill of rights for the elderly in um, assisted living facilities. Mm -hmm. So these are areas, I think, that have great promise. Thank you. Very interesting. Let's talk a little bit about human performance technology and some of our jargon and terminology. Um, <clears throat> is there a, an HPT term that, that you'd like to define because you think maybe it's been misconstrued over time or something that's of particular importance to you in terms of some of our terminology? Sure. 
I'm going to start by saying we need a jargon. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. That's so that we can talk to each other. Mm -hmm. I remember it uh, was uh, probably 15 years ago, if not more, um, I had invited a Russian scientist who had moved to the U.S. Um, to visit with me, and he was an expert in the area of algorithmization. And we were sitting in a McDonald's having a cup of coffee, and we were discussing heuristics and algorithms, and uh, we were looking at scientific ways in which we could measure the impact of different variations, and we were looking particularly linguistically at where you have multiple meanings of words like predlegat in Russian and different strategies. And while we were in this deep discussion, somebody turned around from the seats behind us and tapped me on the shoulder and said, why don't you guys talk English? <laughs> <laughs> And I thought that was humorous. Mm -hmm. But between ourselves, we need a technical language with hardcore meanings to them. Mm -hmm. And just as medical people use their terminology to understand one another and be precise, we have to be as well. But now when we talk to our patients, yes. right, our mm -hmm. clients and matter. so on, we have to be careful in how we use that terminology. And so we've got to move away from the jargon. We can't just simply say, well, you know, basically what I'm going to be doing is an analysis, a front-end analysis, but I'm going to be using Gilbert's uh, BEM, mm -hmm. you know, uh, initially. And then, um, you know, I, I think I'll use a Watkins approach to, yeah, we can't go about right. doing that type of thing. And so we have to simplify our language. Uh, if there were some terms you know, you're saying, uh, I would be careful about the word analysis mm -hmm. and talk more about a diagnosis, for example, which people understand much better. Mm -hmm. and I would use analogies a great deal. So if we're going to do a formative evaluation, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, and, and I heard the other day, I was watching somebody say, well, we're going to do both a formative and a summative evaluation. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and by the way, uh, we're going to probably do some goal-free type stuff as well, you know, uh, to, to talk about, well, we need to capture information that lets us know how we can make the system work better. And we also want to demonstrate that there is a return on the investment. We need to be able to look at our audiences, judge them, and use the words and jargons that they use. So if we're in a business environment, then we've got to be able to use business terminology with them. Mm -hmm. And instead of saying, I'm going to do, you know, a, a prospective ROI, you know, you say, what we're going to do is build a business case to demonstrate what the worth is. Oh, we're going to give you, you know, information on the payback period so you know when you'll get, be getting you know, a return on your investment, and we'll be looking at how much we can return for the money you put in. Um, you know, we, we, if we're talking with uh, an immigrant audience, which sometimes we're, that's mm -hmm. particularly in the areas that are outside the work scope, then that too we have to tailor. And if we're working with a fast food chain, <laughs> then analogies to their processes, which they're very familiar with. So I'm not looking to just make bland, but rather to adapt, use within ourselves a jargon that's very technical, that doesn't have multiple meetings, but very singular types of what we call monosemic meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, there we go with another jargon <laughs> term, rather than polysemic term mm -hmm. uh, meanings. But then we have to do the same as we adapt to the audiences with which we work. One of the goals of this particular video series here is to begin to capture some of the past of ISPI going back to the NSPI days. <clears throat> and can you share with us some of your favorite memories of back in the day, some of the people that had influence, funny stories 
things that make some of these bigger names human. Which stories oh might you God. have to share with us? Uh, probably ten people have told you this. You know, it's the um, how do you know the old the old guys the old guard the old guard the, right uh, <laughs> Lloyd Hummy yes. you know and and Bob Mager and uh, Gabe Ofeish mm -hmm. you know uh, and uh, uh, Bill Detterline and Susan Markle sitting around in a bar and <laughs> trying to create a program on how to tie a knot in a cherry stem from out of a drink, <laughs> you know. I think it was out, of, it was out of Manhattan. I never knew which one, you know, mm -hmm. which one ever would takes the cherry, you know. So, I mean, those are funny stories. Um, uh, I think, for me, because I wasn't in the first wave. Right. I was in the second wave, mm -hmm. the, the ones that came after it. I think that, you know, what struck me the most is whenever they were talking very soon from the funny and social, you know, even having a drink or having a cup of coffee or just sitting around and, you know, shooting the breeze, they would immediately turn to stuff they had done that had a strong database. Mm -hmm. And it, there was a lot of discussion about you know, how they had organized their experiments or their trials and so on. Something I miss here, mm -hmm. that it was all about data. And, and that's disappeared. You know, I find us more ideological these days. Yes. You know? No one stands up from the audience and asks for the data well, That's anymore. right. And when you present the data, you know, there's sort of a glazing over, whereas we lapped it up. Uh, the other thing, as I said, was approachability. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember I was in a session with Joe Harless, and he had just finished ranting, which that was his way of presenting. It was his thing, yeah. It was the rant, but it was a database rant, you know? <laughs> very rigorous and his models were very, you know, strong and he showed the relationships of the elements and he was quick to admit when he had screwed up. And, um, you know, I was still in awe of him. He was a very frightening type of person. And after one of his sessions, um, I went up to him and I said, you know, that was terrific. You know, I just keep learning from you. And he said, you better remember that, you know, because I'm investing in your education, <laughs> you know. And he would come to my sessions, and afterwards he would evaluate me. We'd mm -hmm. walk out the door, and he would tell me, you know, that was very cute, but it wasn't convincing to me. Oh. You know, you can pull the wool over their eyes, <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh -huh. So that straightforwardness, and Bill Detterline did the same type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, the willingness to mentor, mm -hmm. they all would take you under their wing if you showed the least bit of information, uh, interest, sorry. Mm -hmm. they, would, they would be with you and um, give you advice and let me know how it went, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So those are, you know, it's hard to pinpoint a single story, but I will tell you a single incident that okay. probably was one of the most profound. <laughs> and the, that was, I told you I went in 1975 to my very first conference. Mm -hmm. And I met the very famous uh, Bob Mager there. Yes. Right? I mean, and we were in awe of Bob Mager. He was the rage. Everybody knew his behavioral objectives and mm -hmm. so on. And he was redoing his book on uh, preparing objectives. Mm -hmm. And here I was as a student. I had met him, this gaunt, white-haired man. And he said to me, uh, you know, I told him as a student, I admired his work and so on. He said, good, come over here. And he had three covers that were prospective covers for his new book and he had them on cardboard and he said okay I'm going to show you these two tell me which of these two you prefer I said that one 
And then he said, okay, I'll take this one. He took another one. He said, between these two and that one. And then he said, okay, now I'm laying out all three, which ones? And I came up with the same one. And he said, great, you've really helped me in making my decision. And I didn't think much about it until when the book came out and he was thanking people. Among the people he was thanking for helping him in preparing this book was my name. And I was just a student then. Mm -hmm. you know, so this is the type of wonderful stuff. You know, I could go on endlessly with that. Do you, do you sense that our society today is still has that kind of accessibility of the thought leaders, the published people, the presenters at the conference, or has, has that kind of gone away or is it still there? Everybody harkens back to the good old oh, days, yes. whether they were good or not, <laughs> right? So let's start with that. Um, you know, the society's changed. Mm -hmm. In many ways it's grown more open, it's opened itself up to more and diverse types of interventions and ways of looking at things. That's the good news. The bad news, as I've said to you, is I think that we've gotten away from the rigor of the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm hoping that that will return. The research base, the rigor, the um, desire for, or, or not desire, the demand for data mm -hmm. that was present, you know? It didn't matter whether they were in the academic world, uh, like Susan Markle or Phil Tiemann, or they were in the business world, like Joe Harless and Claude Lineberry and Stephanie Jackson. They demanded proof. And that piece I miss. Mm -hmm. Now coming back to the approachability, I think it's just as approachable. I don't quite sense that passion that's there that they shared and that may be my fault because I'm old mm -hmm. <laughs> you know but um, I do hope that somehow or other we regain that in a different way mm -hmm. well Harold thank you very much for this uh, any final words to the viewers about human performance technology and or ISBI <laughs> Well, the sneeze wasn't part of the yeah. final words. <laughs> you know, it's a great society, and it's like a family. It, one of the most exciting things is if you take a look at how many ISPI couples there are, it's amazing. <laughs> I found my wife at ISPI, mm -hmm. you know, and how did I do it? I went to a seminar that she gave with Frank Widra, mm -hmm. and I was blown away by the way, this was in the 70s, they had this computerized database for 35 states tracking competency by competency the performance you know how people performed against a set of standards we call them competencies but they have a set of standards mm -hmm. for people in the supermarket industry and they were in 35 states mm -hmm. you know, this is the largest supermarket holding company in North America and they were so rigorous um, uh, the number of people who met and fell in love with what the other person was doing uh -huh. <laughs> before they fell in love was an amazing type of adventure. And, you know, I've never seen it anywhere else but here. Mm, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much for all that you do for human performance technology and for our society here. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, Guy. Thank you.